G'day guys and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. It's Jesse here and today I'll be doing a different kind of video. I'm actually going to be looking back at the predictions I made at the start of the 2019 AFL season and seeing just how accurate or inaccurate I actually was. Now, as you may remember, I actually did a couple of predictions videos at the start of the year. One was with the ladder predictor and one was without. So today I'm going to go with the one that I didn't use the ladder predictor for because that was the most recent one. That was the one closest to the start of the season. Season. Of course, the end of the 2019 season has come quite abruptly. If you haven't seen it already, we do have a True Footy podcast discussing the grand final and all the latest trade rumors up on the channel. So go check that out if you haven't already. But without further ado, let's get into my predictions made at the start of the year and see just how much of an idiot I was. So the format of the video went that I named each side ranked 18 to first in reverse order. And then I actually gave my predicted grand final and Brownlow and all the award winners and stuff as well. So let's start off with who I had in 18th spot. In 18th spot, surprise, surprise, I've picked the Gold Coast Suns. As everyone knows, they lost Hall, Lynch and May over the offseason. They were already an absolute garbage team to begin with. So it's hard to imagine them getting any kind of improvement on last year. They also lost Jared Lyons, who was probably an underrated part of their midfield. But long story short, I think they're only going to get worse this season. So to start off, I am one from one. Gold Coast did finish last on the back of all those players leaving the club. I also made a fairly good comment about Jared Lyons being an important loss to the Suns. That being said, I probably don't deserve that much credit for tipping Gold Coast to come last. Although I will just say, to toot my own horn, I did tip in another video with the latter predictor one that they were going to lose their last 19 games of the season. So I did nail that. Um, but anyway, we'll move on quickly from there. In 17th spot, I've got Carlton. Like I said in my video about Carlton, I feel like they're starting to get all the pieces together that they need going forward for the next Premiership tilt. But for the time being, they're just too inexperienced. They just haven't got the ready-made talent. So second last, I obviously had Carlton. In hindsight, not a terrible call, but obviously not quite accurate. I think Carlton finished third last. Nonetheless, I'm pretty happy with that and the reasoning behind it. I'd stand by the fact that I think Carlton do have a lot of the pieces in place to make their next premiership assault, uh, but obviously they're a little bit inexperienced. And I think Bolton sort of exposed that younger sort of generation quite a lot, and that's why they wouldn't win games. And then I think T came in and sort of gave expanded roles to more mature players and got them more competitive, which I think was the right move. But uh, overall, pretty happy with that call, saying Carlton in the bottom two. It was only one off in the end. In 16th spot, I've got the Western Bulldogs. Like I said in my video, I really, really rate the talent they've got going there. And I actually think their midfield could be in the top half of the competition. That being said, they've gone really draft heavy with their list management strategy. So it makes me think they're only gonna pump more games into their youngsters. If you told me they were gonna play finals this year, I actually wouldn't find it that incredible. But in terms of ready-made talent, they're pretty top heavy. And I feel like one injury to one of their key players could send the whole thing unraveling. So third last, I did have the Western Bulldogs. And this on paper is a pretty shocking call. The Bulldogs obviously finished seventh to scrape into the finals. Uh, nonetheless, I'm pretty happy with the reasoning behind that. I did say I thought the Bulldogs might just push uh, more games into their younger generation, maybe not focus so much on winning games in the here and now because of their you know, drafting all these young uh, prospects last year. Uh, nonetheless, I did say that they had a top half midfield and that, that I could see them playing finals. So uh, I kind of hedged my bets a little bit, but um, overall, still a pretty average call. Uh, the Bulldogs obviously finished way higher than I predicted. In 15th spot, I've picked St. Kilda. I don't really like this prediction. I've kind of only picked them because I can't put anyone else in the bottom four. And to be honest, it's hard to justify them over other teams. I do think their list is a bit better than what they've actually achieved over the last couple of years. But other than Hanbury coming in to maybe consolidate their midfield, it's hard to see where the improvement's going to come from this year. So to finish out the bottom four, I obviously had St. Kilda. And my logic for that was a bit average. I kind of just felt like I couldn't rate them higher than the teams that I did put higher than them. So. Overall, in terms of the actual ladder prediction, it wasn't too far off the truth. Um, but nonetheless, St. Kilda did have some injury troubles this year. So it's hard to get a gauge on exactly where they're at. It's, sacking their coaches obviously signal that they weren't quite happy in terms of their own internal expectations. Nonetheless, while I didn't quite get it right, I'm fairly comfortable with that prediction. I was only a few spots off and generally got the vibe on them fairly accurate. 14th spot, we've got a team that I've been very hot and cold on and that's Fremantle. I've talked them up because I think some of their mature players are very, very good. And if they're all fit, they could have a really good season. Fife is one of the very best midfielders in the competition. If he can put a full season together and he gets a bit of support from the other midfielders, Fremantle's midfield could actually be really competitive. As we know, the Dockers gained a forward line 
through Hogan and Lobb, but they lost the really important Lockie Neal. Personally, I think they're gonna struggle for a little bit to adapt to new game style, and that's why I have them not jumping up the ladder as much as I previously suggested. So I had Fremantle in 14th and of course they finished 13th and to be honest I think I kind of nailed that prediction. I did say that the mature players were very good in the first half of the year especially when Fremantle had its spine in place with Hamling and Pierce and Hogan. When they had those mature players in the side they were actually playing pretty well. In fact they knocked off GWS and Collingwood away and they beat Brisbane and Geelong as well. While Hogan was important structurally to them, I was kind of accurate in saying that I didn't think he was necessarily going to be fantastic in his first year, and that's pretty much what happened. All in all, though, it was probably more injuries than any other factor that brought Fremantle back down to about 13th spot, but nonetheless, all things considered, fairly good prediction. In 13th spot, I've got Port Adelaide, and this was another tough one for me. I feel like they lost some pretty important outside run and polish with Polek and Wingard leaving the club. Neither of those players are absolute world beaters, but I think it kind of throws off the balance of their midfield. On the other hand, I can see Tom Rockliffe now that he's over his groin issues, having a really massive year. If you guys play AFL Fantasy, he's my biggest recommendation to get into your team. But nonetheless, I don't think it's gonna be enough to lift them much further than where they were last year. I do think they can be a top eight contender this year, but I could also see it unraveling. So all in all, I was probably a little bit inaccurate with this one. Port Adelaide did perform better than I expected. At times this year, they looked all every bit a top eight side, but um, you know, really inconsistent. The one thing I probably underrated was their ability to cover the losses of guys like Wingard and Polek. I thought that would actually be quite damaging to them. But the introduction of a lot of youth, particularly Rosie and Dersma in that first round last year, um, saw them not really drop off that much in terms of quality this year, Port Adelaide. I think they'll probably be internally a little bit disappointed uh, to miss out on finals, but nonetheless, they did perform better than I expected, so I was a little bit off with this one. In 12th spot, I've got the Sydney Swans. On the one hand, I kind of feel like the Swans are hanging by a thread because their end of the last year in the finals was absolutely pathetic. On the other hand, they haven't missed the finals since 2009, and every time someone writes them off, they come back. I don't know if things are a little bit stale at the club. It's kind of the vibe you got from West Coast last year. They haven't really lost anyone major in the off season, but they didn't really gain anyone either. For me, I have them sliding to 12th and I'm sure they're gonna make me look very silly. So with the Sydney Swans, I made a pretty good prediction in that I pegged them to fall out of the eight. The one thing I didn't do quite right was predict how far they would fall. They obviously finished in the bottom four and not as high as 12th. In the end, they had a really sort of transitional year where they're trying to get a lot of games into that next generation, which I think is really, really talented. Buddy Franklin also didn't get on the park that much. so. Pretty um, surprisingly bad year from Sydney. I mean, uh, as I said, I predicted them to slide out of the eight. I didn't expect bottom four for them. So yeah, a little bit off the mark with that one. In 11th spot, I've got another slider and that's Hawthorne. It might seem like a knee-jerk reaction, but losing Tom Mitchell is gonna be absolutely huge for them. I just don't think their midfield depth bats that deep. I know they've recruited Wingard and Scully and in isolation, those are two very good pickups, but I don't think Wingard's the sort of player to lift teams up the ladder. And while Scully is an excellent player, there's obviously doubts on his fitness. I think they're an exceptionally well-coached team and they're brilliant and unearthing talent. So I'm sure they'll unearth some really good young guns this year, but for mine, I don't think they're gonna play finals. Hawthorne's slide to 11th is a fairly solid prediction. They obviously finished fourth last year and this year narrowly missed out on finals or I think they finished like ninth or tenth or something. My basic reasoning for that was the fact that Tom Mitchell obviously broke his leg in the preseason and he's an important player for their midfield. Wingard and Scully were both good pickups but don't quite cover the loss of Mitchell in my opinion. So um, not too far off a mark with the Hawthorne one. I'm fairly satisfied with that. In 10th spot, I've got the Brisbane Lions. This one makes me hesitate a bit because I feel like such a bandwagon at having the Lions rise up the ladder. On the one hand, they lost Dane Beams, but they gained Lockie Neal. So in that sense, they kind of cancel each other out. But this preseason, and I know it's only preseason, they've really impressed me. And I think they're playing with a lot of confidence. I think Jared Lyons might be an underrated acquisition because he's just that extra layer of support in the midfield. The talent of that club is obvious. And if they start playing with a bit of belief, they could go very close to playing finals. So some funny calls in that little Brisbane prediction there. It's funny to see that I thought I was making a big call in having them all the way up to 10th. Of course, they finished second, so I was absolutely nowhere near it with that prediction. I did say that I thought Beams and Neil cancelled each other out, and perhaps on talent they do, but uh, obviously Neil had a far superior year to Beams this year, who um, maybe a little bit over the hill, but obviously had his injury troubles as well, and he's trying to fit into that really packed Collingwood midfield. But uh, on the one plus side, I did say that Jared Lyons was going to be an important player for the Lions, and he absolutely was. 
no pun intended. All in all though, not a fantastic prediction on Brisbane. In ninth spot and just missing out on finals, I've got Geelong. The top end talent at that club is self-evident with Kelly, Dangerfield, Ablett, Selwood. Personally, I wonder if their list is still a little bit too top heavy. They have actively tried to develop some youth. They've unearthed Radagalia, Parfit, Jack Henry, but and those guys are still developing, so I wouldn't be relying on them too heavily just yet. I think they really needed a pressure forward going into this season, and they've added Dalhouse, so he could be a massive coup. Equally, I honestly can see the Cats challenging for the four. I think they've been unfairly written off. The time being, I'm gonna hedge my bets and go with ninth. So with the Geelong prediction, I wasn't really that accurate, but I was happy with the reasoning behind it. Obviously, though, it was a crap prediction. I had them ninth, and they end up finishing on top of the ladder and going out in a prelim. So my question marks on them were whether they're too top-heavy and they really needed to sort of pump games and develop that next layer of talent. I think that's something they really did quite well, particularly in the first half of that season. Some of their second-tier players like Stewart, Atkins, Radigalia, Myers, Parfit, um, those guys really came into their own and that was the difference between Geelong sort of being a mid-tier side and being a top-level side. That's one thing Geelong have been able to do fairly impressively in the last couple of years is really get games into their youth while their stars are in the side and I think that's going to hold them in good stead going forward. In 8th spot and the first finals position, I've got North Melbourne. I feel like they've got a pretty solid nucleus and they're pretty well-rounded from forward, middle and back. They probably lacked some outside run and polish last year, but they've added Polak and Aaron Hall, obviously. The back line's really strong, and they've obviously got one of the best forwards in the competition in Ben Brown. Perhaps you could say they're a little too one-dimensional going forward. Maybe they can stand to develop another goal-scoring option. Overall, however, I think they're starting to become quite an experienced battle-hardened side, and I think they're going to start winning the close games that previously cost them finals. So I had North Melbourne sliding into the top eight, which wasn't a great call in hindsight. Obviously, they started the year really disastrously bad and didn't really have a shout for finals this year. My logic was that they traded heavy for experienced players. I thought Jared Polek, obviously Jasper Pittard as well, was really good acquisitions. On the whole, I think they'll be really disappointed to not make the eight, considering where their list profile is at. Um, so... Obviously not a great prediction, but I think they kind of underachieved, to be honest. It was an interesting point I said about Ben Brown. Uh, obviously, he had a great season, and I said that they needed to develop some other goal-scoring options. It's probably something they'd be fairly happy with this year. Obviously, Larky bogged up, I think, for like 26 goals. Zerha had, you know, 24 or 26 goals as well, and Zeeble pushed forward for 24. So, obviously, that can develop further, but Larky and Zerha are pretty young, so... All in all, that is a bit of a plus for North. In seventh spot, I've got Essendon. Now these guys might be everyone's favorite to bolt into the top four. Personally, I don't really love tipping unproven teams to make it into premiership contention straight away. Obviously on paper, they are one of the most talented lists. I absolutely do concede that. But maybe they're still a little bit inexperience and the lack of finals experience. They don't awesome. strike me as a really mentally strong team and that's probably what it's gonna require for them to compete with the top four. I think their time will come and this year they're probably a good chance to at least win a final, but I'm holding off on the calls for them being a premiership champ. All in all, I think I got that prediction pretty bang on. Essendon finished eighth, not seventh, but nonetheless, they weren't quite experienced or mentally strong enough in my opinion to hold it against the best teams in the competition. I didn't buy into the hype preseason that they were gonna be a top four or a premiership contender. I sort of had them leveling out in that mid table range and that's exactly what happened. In so. sixth spot, I've got the Giants. And now they're a team that's quite easy to write off because they've had extensive outs. But when you think about who's still in their midfield, they're a very strong lineup. You've got Kelly, Cornelio, Ward, Whitfield, Toby Green, Taranto. They've also got important defender Zach Williams back this year. I just think they're too good to write off as a finals contender. Boom! That prediction is absolutely bang on. Obviously, GWS did finish sixth this year, and it was on the basis of the fact that their players who didn't leave the club are all still really good players. Obviously, I didn't predict them making the grand final. That was a surprise. Obviously, I've talked up their list power on paper, but um, again, that was definitely a bit of a surprise. But I'll take it sixth, and they finished sixth, so boom. In fifth spot, I've got Melbourne. Most people are pretty happy to extrapolate Melbourne's form last year and assume they're probably going to win the premiership this year. I understand why people are saying that, but personally, I never really expect a team to improve in a linear progression, particularly when so many of their elite players are so young. Don't get me wrong, I see why there's hype. There is some seriously good talent at that club. And to be honest, I think they could win the premiership from fifth. But equally, I don't know if they have the mental resolve yet to put it together for 22 rounds of a season. 
Should we just skip Melbourne? No, obviously there's not too much worth analysing in my prediction there. I thought they would just sort of consolidate their position in that top four or five and maybe push again for a deep finals challenge. This year, they absolutely sharted the bed, had a lot of injury issues, and I think it sort of crept into their confidence and their psyche. Um, hopefully they can bounce back in the future, but all in all, shock and prediction. In fourth spot, I've got the Crows, and they're my biggest bolter. I think there's been quite a few cases where a team has had a really bad grand final performance, and then after a couple of years have come back. And I think the case could be the same with Adelaide. I know they've had a lot of outs, but they've never really had any problem replacing those outs. Their culture and the development structures seem to be so strong that they can just churn out the talent. Are they a genuine premiership contender? Not until they start beating Melbourne teams at the MCG, but I can see them winning enough home games and developing the Adelaide Oval into a fortress that they can slip into fourth. That one was even worse than the Melbourne prediction. Uh, obviously, Melbourne, nobody saw coming. I really doubt anyone had Melbourne do uh, bottom two at the start of the season, so I kind of forgive myself for this one. Uh, with the Adelaide one, I tried to be bold and tip a you know a real bolter into the top four, and they were a crap choice. Obviously, I was kind of relying on the fact that they would sort of recover their ability and talent from the team that made the 2017 grand final. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen at all. Maybe I underrated the quality of the players that left, but also I think there's a huge mental aspect of what's happening at Adelaide. You know, they've got to have five or six players request trades this offseason. So that one was a little bit hard to predict, but overall, I think I severely overrated them, and that is a crap prediction. In third spot, we've got the reigning premiers, the West Coast Eagles. Now, I can easily see the Eagles being top two again, but because I'm an Eagles fan, I feel inclined to underrate them a bit so I don't get as much hate in the comments. I'm still going to get hate in the comments. For me, I think the biggest two challenges facing the Eagles will be the mental side of it. Can they go the whole season and compete for another flag? We saw Richmond struggle with it last year. And secondly, they've got a few more tough away MCG fixtures this year, which might see them slip out of the top two. So the Eagles actually finished fifth and not third, but to be honest, I think I got that prediction pretty bang on. If not for a bit of a capitulation in the final round, they would have finished exactly where I said they did. And obviously, I think the there was two factors in why the Eagles didn't replicate last year, uh, which I named. So the mental side of it, I think they started the year really poorly and they couldn't sustain their sort of comeback run uh, for the whole season in the last couple of rounds, I, especially against Hawthorne. They mentally capitulated. Uh, and obviously, the harder fixture was absolutely a factor because they lost one extra game from last year. And they did have a really tough run playing teams like Richmond, Collingwood, Brisbane, and Geelong all away. So while I was two spots off with that one, I'm fairly happy with that prediction. In second spot, I've got Richmond. Now, as we all remember, Richmond were the premiership fancy for most of last year, but kind of went down in flames in the prelim. And you'd have to say a lot of that could be attributed to their mentality. Probably just weren't quite motivated to get over the second last hurdle. They're probably looking at the following week already. I think they're gonna have a renewed motivation to go all the way this year. And that's why I see them finishing second. And that's before you even consider they've added Tom Lynch. Now, at the risk of tooting my own horn again, I'm really happy with the Richmond prediction as well. Kind of got that bang on. They finished third, I predicted second. Uh, but I did predict that, you know, mentally they were going to have a renewed sort of a motivation to get all the way this year. And I think that's exactly what they saw. There were maybe some question marks over the acquisition of Tom Lynch and how that would look for them structurally. You know, Jack Rewalt missed a lot of the year in that sort of mid to early part of the year and Tom Lynch was important then. And then he really came into his own the second half of the year and between he and Rewalt, probably the best two forward combina combination at the moment in the game. So overall, pretty happy with Richmond as second spot, mind you, probably not the hardest prediction. In top spot, winning the minor premiership, I've gone with the Magpies. To be honest, the top spot could go to any one of those top three that I've mentioned, but I've picked the Pies just because they've probably added their list most on paper, in my opinion. On the other hand, sometimes losing a grand final, like I said before, can have a destabilizing effect on a club. So, so I could see them sliding to fifth or sixth, but on paper, they are as good as anyone in the competition. Their midfield just bats so deep, in addition to their elite ruck. So the Collingwood prediction's okay. Obviously, they were a premiership contender this year, making it all the way to the prelim and, you know, four points off or whatever it was, a grand final. Uh, that being said, they finished fourth, not first, so I probably did overrate how good they were going to be this year. I did rate them really highly on paper, but I think maybe the Pies struggled to really optimize the talent they had at their disposal. We saw the same thing with Geelong, maybe 2018, had so much ability and not sure how to optimize all their players. There's probably a mental aspect of it as well with Collingwood. You know, they did get a buy in the finals. They went in as the home prelim side and frankly bottled it against uh, a GWS side who were, you know, rank under dogs really and I know GWS were good but you know that is a massive opportunity wasted by Collingwood and they will be devastated. 
So that's my predicted ladder and I probably will go with the predicted grand final of Collingwood and Richmond. And I'd have to probably tip Richmond in that instance. Like I said, they're just a really professional outfit. And I think the pain of losing last year could really galvanize them. So that's a pretty good prediction. I had Richmond Collingwood grand final and Richmond winning. Now Collingwood, as I just said, four points off making that grand final. I think Richmond probably would have beaten them. That being said, I did predict a Collingwood-Richmond grand final pre-finals and I tipped Collingwood to win that, but uh, we'll just ignore that. To finish off, I'll fire off a few other predictions. I'm gonna go with Nat Five to win the Brownlow medal. Boom, Nat Five did win the Brownlow. Coleman medal's tough. I can't really imagine any forwards in the top few teams will kick enough goals. Obviously there's Lynch at Richmond, but he's got Jack Rewalt to compete with. Is Josh Kennedy gonna play enough games to win the Coleman? I'm gonna say Ben Brown. Coleman prediction wasn't terrible, but I didn't even name the guy who won Jeremy Cameron, so that was a bit of a shit call. I did nominate Ben Brown as my final guess, and he had a fantastic year and actually nearly won the whole thing. Um, I did mention Josh Kennedy, but we did see a big drop off from Kennedy this year. Unfortunately, I think the end is nigh for him. Hopefully one or two more good years from him though. For Rising Star, I feel like it's very early, but it's a two horse race for me between Zach Butters and Sam Walsh. I'm gonna go with Zach Butters. So I tip Sam Walsh and Zach Butters to be the contenders for the Rising Star, and I tip Butters to win overall. Not a great call. He wasn't even the best Port Adelaide Rising Star this year. Obviously, Connor Rosie was a second spot to Walsh. So, you know, I probably won't claim that one. Walsh and Rosie were the clear best two this year. <laughs> All right, guys, well, that's it. Thank you for tuning into my 2019 predictions. This was fun. Uh, I will probably start doing this every year as long as my predictions aren't terrible. I'm pretty happy with that, actually. I thought, thought I was gonna be way more off than I actually was. Melbourne and Adelaide with the two howlers I had and uh, Brisbane wasn't a great prediction either. So, but other than that, fairly okay with all the reasoning in that and uh, hopefully I'll be just as accurate next year. Like I always say guys, if you are new to the True Footy YouTube channel, please consider subscribing for more AFL content. There's gonna be more of that as we get into the trade and draft period. I do love this time of the year. Also, if you haven't already, I do have a personal YouTube channel called Jesse Thomas, the link of which is in the description of this video. Uh, I've kind of taken a break from it over the finals because I've just been so busy with True Footy. But if you're into it, um, go check it out and subscribe. Thanks. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you all very soon somewhere on YouTube. Cheers.